morning, my name is Michael for LS1Tech.com and welcome to part nine of my Carb Legal LS3 Roadmaster Wagon Swap Project. In this episode, we're gonna tell you how it's very easy to spend over $40,000 on a build just like this one. So what we're gonna do in this video, first we're gonna start with a few disclaimers about the pricing and everything that was involved. We're gonna talk about every part you need to do an LS swap. We're gonna say all the parts and the part numbers for the things that we used on this particular build. And then we're gonna talk about whether or not it was worth it. First, in terms of the disclaimers, number one, you don't have to do everything at once. You don't have to use all of the parts that I used. And there are of course many, many different ways to do an LS swap. This is a more of a premium, every part is new, comes with a warranty build. So this is more of a high-end build. There are obviously ways to do it more affordably, but that is gonna be up to your research. All I can tell you about is my particular build. Also, this build was only made possible through our partnerships and sponsorships. So we had people like Magnaflow, Holly, Guarantee Chevrolet and Chevrolet Performance, Summit Racing, Dakota Digital, Michelin Tires, American Racing Wheels, all of these folks either offer discounts or parts to help make this experiment possible. Next up, inflation is a big, big thing here. I'm recording this right now in December, 2022. And so the prices that I'm giving you are based on prices today, but most of the parts that I bought were almost two years ago now. Everything is now more expensive here in December of 2022 as I'm recording this, so going into the 2023 year. Next up, let's talk about everything you need to do an LS swap. Now, there, obviously, there's gonna be tons of variables. This is where your research is gonna take you many, many different places, forums and Facebook groups and everywhere all over the internet to figure out what you exactly need for your particular build. But generally speaking, here is the bottom line list of parts that are universal. The engine, transmission, engine computer, transmission computer, a wiring harness, a starter, engine accessories like the Hollyman mount system, an LS swap oil pan, motor mounts, transmission cross member, drive shaft, a strong rear limited slip differential, something like an Eaton True Track, a fuel system capable of 60 PSI constant pressure, along with a fuel filter regulator, an accelerator pedal, an air intake with mass airflow sensor, a quality radiator slash cooling system, a gauge cluster like this one from Dakota Digital, or adapters for your original gauges, and don't forget get headers and a killer exhaust. Moving on to my particular build, and of course I'm moving inside because it's really loud outdoors. Most of these prices are from summitracing.com who gave us some nice discounts. I also used Amazon, Napa, O'Reilly's, AutoZone, all the local companies to get miscellaneous parts and little knickknacks and tools. So overall, total build, if you were to do a car just like mine using a Roadmaster, $43,625. Of that, $37,740 in parts, $1,635 in tools, and $4,250 in labor. Again, I did most of the labor myself. Next up, let's talk about the drivetrain, which is $25,195. The majority of this, of course, is going to be the engine, motor, computers, and everything like that. So when you get the LS3 E-Rod 4L65E Connect and Cruise system, it's gonna come with the motor and the transmission, a torque converter and attachment kit, engine and transmission computers, wiring harnesses, headers, and of course it comes with the catalytic converter. So almost everything that you need to get the engine running. But the one thing to note about buying brand new Chevrolet Performance Connect and Cruise systems or crate motors, Chevrolet or GM has a minimum advertised price. The price you're seeing here within about $500 because sometimes there's some rebates and so forth, but basically the minimum price is the price you're seeing. Next up, engine accessories. We use the Holly Premium Mid-Mount Engine Accessory Kit with the SFI certified damper, Holly LS swap oil pan, the Holly oil pan baffle kit, the F body crankshaft oil deflector, a genuine GM oil pan gasket. I also picked up a set of ICT billet LS swap oil pan bolts, and that's because the LS3 crate motor uses one less bolt than the Holly pan. The Holly LS dipstick and tube, TCI trans dipstick and tube, a GM genuine LS3 starter, ICT billet starter bolts, the Chevrolet Performance Air Intake Kit, motor mounts and transmission cross member from BRP Hot Rods, AKA Muscle Rods, use the 1991 to 1993 kit for my application. We got a drive shaft rebuild from a company called Drive Lungs Incorporated, the Eaton True Track Differential, 342 rear gears in an installation kit, and we paid Frank at South by 4x4 $800 in labor. Rounding things up, we bought three AC Delco oil filters, 18 quarts of 5W30 Mobile One oil, and two big jugs of Dexron 6 transmission fluid from O'Reilly's. Moving on to the fuel system, which is going to cost you about $410, Walboro 255 liter per hour in-tank fuel pump. This is a 1994 to 1996 
Impala SS, a Roadmaster drop-in fuel pump, and it works on the 91 to 93s as well. You have to do a little bit of modifications, but it works nicely and uses the original sending unit. We also used a whole bunch of Earl's Performance, which Holly owns, but Earl's Performance Vapor Guard fuel hose, as well as a miscellaneous set of AN-6 fittings. And basically, the thing to note about doing any of these custom systems, AN fittings, any size basically, but dash six, dash 10, dash eight, whatever you're working with, they add up really quickly. The cheaper ones are about $5 each, and you can get up to 10, 15, and even $20 each for the dash 10s. In the case of the Earl system, the Vapor Guard is rated to 225 PSI. We're of course using only 60 PSI, and all of the dash six fittings are really, really nice. During the process of the build, had to pick up a couple extra fittings from other brands that weren't Holly or Earl's, and they were not as good. And last but not least, we have the AC Delco Gold Fuel Filter. This is a part number straight out of a C5 Corvette, and this is what GM recommends when you're installing this system in your hot rod. Next up, we're talking gauges, $1,195. For this, we use the Dakota Digital Universal Gauge Cluster, the VHX 1023. We also added a body control module, as well as miscellaneous wires, connectors, tape tools, and loom. And last but not least, and Earl's performance seals it firewall grommets. Moving on to talk about the cooling system and the HVAC system for $1,870. The heart of our system is a Champion 3-core all-aluminum radiator that was designed for 1994 to 1996 B-body Impalas. If you decide to buy this radiator, make sure to buy it directly from Champion Cooling because otherwise third-party dealers come in and they just mark up the price unnecessarily. That's what happened to me. Next up, I bought eBay 1996 Chevy Impala SS dual electric fans. I've got a Dakota Digital fan controller, a vintage air trinary switch, and from Holly, we've got the NOS two-stage watt RPM activated window switch. This is installed so the Sandin SD7 compressor that's included with the Holly mid-mount accessory kit that it turns off when RPMs go above 4,000 RPM per the installation instructions. I also bought a GM Genuine Coolant Recovery Reservoir, which was where we fill the system and it's used as the overflow tank. We spent $300 at Budget Air in Lawndale, California. The guy there is Earl and he built custom AC lines as well as did some of the AC installation wiring. For the transmission cooler lines, we used Mr. Gasket housing as well as Dash 6 AN fittings. For the oil cooler, we used the Earl's LS oil cooler adapter, as well as Mr. Gasket hosing and Dash 10 fittings, upper and lower radiator hoses, which I found at my local parts store, miscellaneous heater hose, T fittings and clamps, and a few gallons of Peak Universal 5050 coolant. Moving on to talk about the exhaust, which sounds so very good. The estimated price here is $4,450. This section has a little bit more estimation because of all the work Magnaflow did, and I don't know how exactly how much that would cost, but Here's how it breaks down. Magnaflow used two and a half inch universal builder parts, and we used two Magnaflow Universal XMOD muffler systems, two and a half inch. The estimated labor for what Magnaflow did in getting everything started was $1,000, but it might be a little bit more. Next, we went to see Luis at 3C Performance in Los Angeles. He charged me $1,300 for parts and labor. That included the flex joints install, the Hemholtz chambers, and the wiring and installation for the active valves. And last but not least, we used some heat shielding from DEI, some heat shielding and some tape to try to keep everything cool. Next up, we have suspension, $8,870. Four brand new 18 by nine and a half American racing wheels. Unfortunately, they are discontinued at the moment, even though I absolutely love their design. We also have four Michelin Pilot Sport all season tires, which help with safety, acceleration, and grip. The labor for mounting and balancing was about a hundred bucks at a local shop. We also installed the Willwood D52 front caliper kit, power stop brake rotors, custom stainless steel brake lines, and DOT4 brake fluid. Underneath the car, you'll find a QA1 front sway bar, a Hotchkiss rear sway bar for wagons, QA1 upper control arms, QA1 lower control arms, QA1 front coilovers, QA1 rear coilovers, QA1 boxed lower trailing arms, which you need for the rear sway bar, and QA1 upper adjustable trailing arms to make sure we get the pinion angle exactly correct. Moving on to steering, we've got a Borgensen 12.7 to 1 universal steering box kit, power steering hoses, AC Delco power steering fluid, a power steering cooler, Hotchkiss steering rebuild kit, and Hotchkiss tie rod sleeves. And last but not least, we have labor for the alignment. It included a corner balancing as well as the very difficult installation of those upper trailing arms. Breaking this down even further, let's talk about the tools. I got a two ton engine hoist from Harbor Freight. I got the load leveler from Harbor Freight, a rigid one half inch impact gun battery and the charger, set of Nyko impact sockets, whole Duralas socket and wrench set. That was about $100 by itself. And then I just kept on adding accessories, extra swivels, extra links, little knickknacks and tools from that as well. So 
kind of estimating the price there. Also picked up a three ton Duraless jack as well as four jack stands, an LS hub installer and puller, a ball joint separator, miscellaneous pry bars and picks and a Dremel. Now please note you will also need a grinding wheel for some of the suspension work and some of the fabrication. I borrowed one of those from my neighbor and then I also owned a Milwaukee drill before I started. All right, folks, there you have it. Over $43,000 if you were to try to recreate this particular build, paying full price for everything, by the way, not including taxes, not including the car, over $43,000 to do a build just like this one. Which leads me to one very important question. Is it worth it? On one hand, we have to look at financial viability. On a build like this, as cool as the Roadmasters are to me, they aren't as collectible as something like a C10 truck. Since this doesn't come from as popular a community, since it's not not quite as collectible, particularly when resto modded, it's really hard to place a value on this. So I spent about $3,000 to buy the car. If you were to recreate this build, it would be another $43,000. So we're basically at like forty-six dollars to $50,000 in cost and time and effort and everything all in to build a car exactly like this. And you have to say to yourself, man, I don't know if this is worth $50,000. People have already been offering to buy this from me. And the truth is, if I said I wouldn't take under $50,000 for this particular car, as it sits, they would probably laugh at me. It's probably not worth that much. In that sense, it's financially irresponsible to do a build like this one because you could be negatively into the car. You could build this nice fancy car exactly to your liking and then never be able to sell it for all the parts and labor and effort that you put into it. So that's kind of a downside. The other reason not to do a build like this is that my first advice is always to buy a stock OEM car that does all the things that you want. So for example, Right here, I have my 2013 Boss 302 from the factory, 444 horsepower. It's super, super fast and great and tight, and it drives a whole lot better than my homemade wagon. My Mustang is wholeheartedly a better vehicle all around, except for the fact that it doesn't fit people as well as the wagon does. The wagon obviously has more storage and more room for people. New cars are also safer. So this thing behind me is amazing now, but it is three decades behind in terms of safety, which is another thing to consider when you're building something for your family. And so for those reasons, a hot rod project for something niche like a Buick Roadmaster, it might not be worth it to do it. However, there are about three reasons why you should consider a build like this. Number one, because where are you gonna find a car like this in 2022 or 2023? V8 sedans, a V8 station wagon, naturally aspirated for that matter. Yes, there's some stuff from Mercedes that's amazing, but an Audi, but they're turbocharged and super expensive, over $100,000. You could get a used, Magnum SRT or a CTS-V wagon, and those are, well, the SRT Magnum is probably cheaper than doing this. The CTS-V is more expensive than doing this. The Dodge Charger, they have a couple options for that, but that's, it's the last model year of that. So it's really hard to find anything that's gonna sit eight people and do what this car now can, which is zero to 60 in 5.01 seconds. We're gonna talk about this more in a future video but it also, I've gotten up to 28.2 real world MPG while driving around on the highway at 60 miles an hour. If you're gonna keep something for a long time, if the journey is important to you, the experiences, the, the knowledge, learning how to do something, building something with friends or family, the joy of owning something that you made yourself, the fact that you have a 30 year old car that's going to have a brand new with a warranty drivetrain in it that can now go another 100, 200,000 miles and do it fast and fun and all those different things. If that matters to you, it might be worth it to spend this type of money. And of course, you don't have to do every single thing I did. You don't have to do the suspension the same way that I did. You And you obviously don't have to use a Chevy Performance Connecting Cruise System as much as I enjoyed that process and the ease and simplicity of it and the, the 50 state legal component. You could do this a lot cheaper. And so if you were to be able to build one of these similar to what I've done for 30 or 40 grand and this has that kind of classic cool nostalgia factor going on for it that really turns heads funny like I get so much attention to this more than when I'm in with my Mustang it's a unique experience and there's a lot of pride of ownership and a pride of buildership and at the end of the day is it worth it again that's really gonna be up to you I would say that if you're doing something collectible like a, like a truck or a classic SUV or something like that something that is gonna have extra value it would be 100% worth it here it's debatable since B bodies and wagons 
Mustangs are a little bit more niche compared to trucks and compared to Mustangs and Camaros and those types of things. Doesn't quite have the collector car market that's kind of built in. But that being said, if you plan to keep the car for a long time, if you plan to make this your daily driver or weekend cruiser or anything like that, it's a pretty unique process, a pretty interesting process. All right, guys, I'm rambling. So wrapping things up here, thank you so much for watching. I hope you all are well and safe, and we will see you on the next video.